to look Whatever, at you, yeah. dude. Fucking blowing up. It's stressful. Is it stressful? For sure. Yeah, I didn't get much sleep last night, and I completely forgot. I was actually writing a song. My mom, my, my mom, my drummer were down there. They were yelling, "They're like podcast." I thought they were saying Bobcat because I live out in the middle of the woods. I was like Bobcat. At the end of the day, they're like podcast. <laughs> it was funny. Do they help you remember oh, the shit. title? Yeah, I got to Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Everybody does, except for me. Everybody remembers shit but me. So. Dude, I did not think you like, remember. So I was running. I'm just home. like bumbling around. So <laughs> I was running home from teaching a class and I was like, like literally like brushing my hair as I'm running upstairs. And I was like, man, he ain't, he ain't going to remember anyways and i sat down mm. and as soon as i opened the computer it said dylan wilson is already in the waiting room yeah. i was like look at him i'm so yeah excited. i should have just played it off and be like yeah i'm so professional i know what i'm doing but <laughs> yeah, i don't exactly. i have no f- idea and, no f- idea what i'm doing and so. we've been recording so I, I can include that your mom helps you keep up with your podcast interviews dude my mom is my f- day my mom is my like that's my, my ride or die dude co-defendant mother whatever <laughs> i love that your dad is an actual co-defendant. Have y'all ever actually been arrested together? Because my favorite story, let's go ahead and start with this and then we'll back up. Can you tell the story when you guys were running away and he got caught by a shoelace? Yeah, for sure. So oh, we were in Florence and um, I was underage. I was 17 years old. I was on the run from a uh, DCS. I didn't really meet my dad till I was like a teenager, right? So I ran when I graduated high school. They were like, we're going to put you in state's custody until you're 19. You know, we're going to hold you. I was like, no, the f- you're not so, phew, gone, you know, ran. And, um, we were just like, hang out with like, so I was like selling LSD, like college kids and just doing a bunch of bad shit. I shouldn't be. We were at this bar called on the rocks. They kicked us out cause I was 17, you know, and I was like drinking and shit. And they're like, you can't do that. And I was like, sorry. And, um, so like, I guess, I don't know if they called the cops or what happened, but we were like walking back to the apartment. They blue lighted, just went, whoop, whoop, you know, like that. So we just took off running through people's yards just took out, you know, and, um, all of a sudden he's not with me anymore. You know, he's not next to me. I'm like, if it wasn't my dad, I wouldn't have turned around. I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't care. I wouldn't have turned around if it wasn't my dad, but I turn around, I get back and I was like, he's like caught up on the fence and shit. And I'm like, what are you doing, man? Like you can't jump over a four foot fence. So like I get him down and we get back to the apartment and he's like, dude, my sho- my shoelaces got stuck. My shoelaces got stuck on the thing. I was like, Oh, I guess that makes sense. And then we get back. I look down, he's wearing boat shoes. They don't even have shoelaces. I'm like, what do you, what happened? Like, what's going on with you? Mm-hmm. I love that story. I heard you tell that story on back alley chat and I yeah, love yeah. that story. So but yeah, let's back up a little. So you didn't meet him until you were a teenager. Let's talk about where you're from growing up. I know your mom raised you. Just walk me through your childhood a little bit. My biological dad, the one that was the story, was, you know, I just told, uh, he was, uh, he was in the army. I was born in an army base in Maryland, but he's from Alabama. My mom was from Tennessee. They got a divorce and he went to prison. He spent like probably, I think like 13 non-consecutive years in total in prison. So my stepdad, you know, for early part of my childhood was, you know, the main father figure in my life, but he was pretty bad on drugs. My mom was pretty bad on drugs. And then I got put in state's custody and then I lived with my grandparents. And so I was like, kind of like half raised by my grandparents, half raised by my mom. Yeah. So, and, that's, and then I met my dad when I was like, I think like six, 15 or 16, something like that. So. Okay. Did you know he was in prison? What did they tell you about where he was? Did yeah. They- I'd, I'd, I'd gotten like letters and stuff like that. And he was like a severe alcoholic and, and uh, like a mean drunk. And I mean, I don't know. It's like kind of like the cat calling the kettle black or whatever. Cause you know, everybody was using at that time the only people that weren't were my grandparents so it's like oh, he's an alcoholic it's like you smoke meth so i don't know what to do it's like he goes to sleep we're like we don't so <laughs> so were you going to school and stuff did you actually go to school what were you like in school awful um no i made i made good grades but i got in a lot of trouble i got in a lot of trouble and, and i don't think that i even really went to my uh, third grade really i think that i was just like when i got but in state's custody, they were like, just put me in fourth grade. And they're like, I don't think you can do that. I'm not going to go at all then, you know? So, but they put me in fourth grade and, uh, yeah, but I don't know. I had a love hate relationship with school. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Especially high school. High school was rough. Yeah. In what sense? Every, what do you mean? Every sense, you know, scent, eyes, you know, all of it. No, I, I, uh, it was just rough. Like, you know, like struggling was, I uh, was a drug addict and, and I went to rehab for the first time I was 14. I've gotten fights a lot. 
got in a lot of fights. Just uh, going to different high schools, never really like having the same friend group and shit and stuff like that. I mean, the only good thing I think was meeting people that I, you know, actually play music with to this day. Actually, last night, the dude that played drums for this other band was the dude I grew up with, Greg. And we grew up, he grew up right down the road from me here. I moved back here in 2019 when my grandfather passed away. My grandmother has Alzheimer's. So you're in Nashville, right? Is that where you are? I'm in uh, Columbia, which is like uh, about an hour south. Okay. That's uh, where, where I grew up, like way out in the middle of the woods and stuff. So you went to your first rehab at 14. When did you start mm-hmm. using? Like when's the first time you remember getting high? Like 12 years old. I, mean, I was smoking pot, taking lower tabs and moved to drinking and stuff. And yeah, I feel like that. Yeah, I got caught with some whiskey at school because I was selling my grandparents liquor because they had an abundance of it. So I was selling it to other kids in school and the mother that was supposed to show up and buy it and then called out of school that day. So I'm just like walking around with this bottle of whiskey in my backpack all goddamn day. And uh, they happened to search the backpacks in gym that, that day. And he was like, what's this? You know, like that. Sorry. I was like, shake like, what's this? And I was like, why don't you smell it? Mother? How about you? Uh, you know what it is, you alky. Yeah. And then I so I had to go to rehab for like, it was like 50 days or some shit like that. And I was like the youngest one. And it was really weird. Yeah. So yeah. when did, did you graduated high school though, right? Do I give off the vibe that I didn't? No, you don't. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah, yeah no, I, no, I graduated high school. It's, <laughs> it's really easy in Tennessee. You just have to show up. They're like, can you read? You're like, not really. They're like, all right, just get the fuck out of here. Here's this paper. <laughs> Go learn to weld or something. No, you give off obviously a highly intelligent vibe because you can't write lyrics the way that you write lyrics. If you're... An idiot. I thought you were just going to cut it off. You can't write lyrics. And I, I was like, Whoa, Jesus, <laughs> no, thanks. No, you can't write lyrics the way that you write lyrics. You got to show your teeth to eat. There's a lot there that's powerful stuff. That's why I wanted to talk to you. But also given your background, I was like, I wonder if he's got like a GED framed on his in his grandma's room somewhere. I actually have a friend who has yeah. her GED framed at her grandma's house. And she's like, it's That's so cute. humiliating that she framed my GED. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah. but at least she's proud of you. Yeah, yeah. What, so she finally did it. <laughs> when did you start playing music? How did that come into your life? My mom loves music. My grandmother loves music. Everybody in my family loves music. But my stepdad, he, uh, he had a lot of friends. He's a lot, he was considerably younger than my mom. He had a lot of friends that played music and stuff like that. My stepdad's one of those people that's like good at every fucking thing and it's gross. You know what I mean? Like you can just do everything. Like just like rebuild a transmission or like play guitar. And then you're like, this person's done meth. It's gotta be, you know, but, um, he was. And, uh, no, he taught, he got me a, my, he got me like my first like actual guitar, the Mexican Strat. It was a uh, blurple and he got it for $150 from this dope head. And he like taught me a few chords. And I was like, I don't think this is for me. He's like, promise you, if you just keep, you know, playing and shit, you'll, you'll get the hang of it. And you'll, 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 you'll be so glad you did it. Yeah, he was right. He was right. He's not, I mean, he's the one first one that showed me like violent films and, and Nirvana and pixies and, and shit like that. And he, he grew up half on a hippie farm in Summertown, which we actually stayed there quite a bit. <clears throat> he had a pretty rough childhood and shit, but he, he was a good dude. He got me into music really. Yeah. And then uh, I just kind of used it as an outlet. I just stay in my room and smoke pot and masturbate and play guitar for my whole high school year. So I think that's how all the greats started. If they're being honest, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> I feel like I've heard John Lennon said the same thing. So how yeah. old were you when he gave you that guitar? Do you remember? I was either turning 12 or 13. I can't remember. Okay. I believe I was in, I was in seventh grade. I know that. And those were your big musical influences, the couple that you just named? Yeah, sort of. I mean, like, you know, when you're very first learning to play guitar and shit, you know, like Blink-182 were the easy song, Weezer and stuff like that, which I mean, I named my son, his middle name's Rivers after Rivers Kumo from Weezer, just because I really like his, you know, his songwriting. I really think it's like simplistic and just like at the time it was very, you know, clever, you know, like I just thought, you know, there's some really, he's a really good songwriter, but yeah. Oh shit. Sorry, my phone's dying. It's all right. I'll be okay. Okay. You might need to charge it. You might need to plug it in while we're talking. Or is it plugged in? Yeah. Uh, no, it's not. It's not. I got my headphones plugged in, but I'm on 20 right now. Oh, I'll be all right. We'll figure it out. 20, it will it won't die. And if it happens to you, just come back in. It'll be fine. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a drug addict, dude. Like, I know how long my phone has to charge. You know what I mean? I'm like, yeah. looking around and like, at shell stations, like, is there a fucking outlet around here? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Totally. So <laughs> yeah. I, I do want to talk about that too, but I do have one quick question. So you mentioned the farm that you spent some time on. Mm-hmm. Did your house really burn down in a meth fire and that's why you were on the farm? 
It did. Can you it did. Um, there's not much to it except I woke up to a big orange ball of flaming like fire outside my granddad's house that we were just at, you know, we were staying at. And I, did, I was always wondering, I was like, why are we staying at granddad's house and we got a fucking house? You know, it's, you know, because they were doing some bad shit in there. So, and they were near. Yeah, but it was cool though. You saw it explode? Oh, yeah. So there was like a, it was like a house, which was like an actual house. My great grandfather, my stepdad's grandfather lived in like this, like, old school single wide like like maybe i don't know 50 yards from it and i remember i woke up and just seeing like this it was i knew it was nighttime and it just freaked me out because it was like i lived out in the middle of nowhere and just like this orange like coming from the blinds i was like what the fuck is that and i just like remember standing outside in the yard and looking at it you could just feel like the heat the intense heat and it was insane but it was like it was crazy it was beautiful but it was also like oh my shit's gone you yeah know? Did you know what caused that fire at the time or did you? Not at, not at the, not at the time, not at the time. No. And you know, it's weird that it never even really bothered me. Like I think that they went at the time, it still doesn't, I don't know, for some reason. And it's not like a dissociation. It's not like a, and and able to, unable to feel shit or anything. It's just that like, I'm just like, when bad shit happens, I'm like, of course, of course, you know what I mean? Of course that's what's, what's going to happen. You know, I think that, I don't know, maybe, maybe he's born with it. Maybe it's trauma. I don't know. (laughs) I've never heard that. That's hilarious. Who was making the meth in there? Are you allowed to say? Who was it? I'll tell you in a couple of years. Okay. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I don't know. I, I do know, but I don't really. You don't have I'm to not, say. Okay. Shouldn't, yeah, I shouldn't. Okay. And then you went and spent some time on a farm sometimes when that had happened. How old were you when it happened? I was in um, second grade, I believe. Yeah, second grade. Okay. So little. So. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 2002. So you start playing guitar at 12. When do you start smoking meth and getting into like harder stuff? Were you still in high school? So I started doing like acid and hallucinogens and shit like that around the same time I started smoking pot and shit. And then when I was 14, I started doing meth and I did that kind of like off and on, not really consistently. And like back then it was a lot stronger. You know what I mean? So like, it's not the same but then like I did like a little bit of like heroin and opanas and stuff like that, but I've just never been one for naps. So I was like, you know, I was always like, Hey, I wonder how long I can stay up. You know, the other dude in the room's like probably a long time. I'm like, who are you? You know? <laughs> yeah. Cause you never got strung out on heroin. Right. I've heard you say that you tried it, but you never became like a junkie. Not really. Not really. I, I don't know. Like I've, I kind of got like a little bit stuck on, uh, like suboxone there for a little bit just because like it was easy to hide you know what i'm saying it's easier to like not you know like when you're twack gal like twacky jan like it's hard to hide but if you're just like a, sleeping all the time he's like man he must be working so hard you know? yeah also back then i don't know when you were doing it when i was on suboxone they weren't even testing for it yet so my right. rehab it wasn't right. like halfway through my rehab they started testing right. for it when i was in high school i actually had to get drug tested which I don't really know how f-ing legal this shit is because like Centerstone, which is like this like really bad government funded mental health thing. That's just like, it's a bunch of children with prescription pads pretty much, you know? And so like, they would just like come in and drug test me at school. I'm like, I didn't sign up for this shit. Did my parents sign me up for this shit? Cause I don't think you could do this. You know, like, why? why I'm not, you know, the only one doing this. Why were you so, on their so. radar? Had you got 5150? I was just wild. Okay. You know what I mean? I was just crazy. And like, I never, I don't know. It was just wild, man. I don't really know. I just, I was just really, really like, I kind of like, it was kind of like a high in itself to be obstinate, you know, or to be it to, you know, to be, to defy the authority, to be rebellious, I guess. I don't know. So how did your music get affected when you started doing harder drugs or did it? Did you continue playing and it would help you? Because sometimes in the beginning it can help that's that's what's so weird that's what's so weird is the only time i've never not played music is when i'm legally confined behind walls then there's no instruments like in jail or like rehab or whatever so i've I've always played music that's always been like my one discipline and i think that's been like the, the only thing kind of like keeping me tethered to the earth when did you start songwriting and thinking, I can do this too? Like, I enjoy playing this. I enjoy other people's songs, but I'm good too. I, I started writing songs before I could even, like, have conversations with people. You know what I'm saying? Like, I always wrote songs. Like, it was, I mean, my, my dad told me I was, you know, as a kid, like, just making up shit, you know, singing it, terrorizing the neighborhood, just singing crazy shit. So, when did you get into your 
band? Uh, me and my my brother, he's not my blood brother, but uh, Jacob, uh, we both skated and we both started playing guitar around the same time. Actually, he was just here not that long ago. We've known each other our whole lives. And we kind of like had like his his mom's boyfriend at the time had like a drum set and like I knew some power chords and shit. So he would just get, he would just let us be really loud. He played it like, he played like the second one band. I can't remember, but they play like Vans Warped Tour and shit. So he just like really like, you know, was like, yeah, that's cool. You guys do that, you know? And so we did that. So I guess that would be technically my first band or whatever. And then, but my first real band was in high school with my buddy, Greg, who like, you know, like I mentioned him earlier, he grew up down the street. We've had different like names, but it was always just me and him for a while. It was like, I think it was like Acid Indigo or some weird heady shit. And then like my Nona, which we actually was because we had our, an Italian friend and he's like, I gotta call my Nona. We're like, who the fuck is Nona? You know, like, who's my Nona? And he's like, it's my grandmother. And I was like, oh, okay. So we like, named our brand my Nona. Yeah. So that one, was, we were together for a while with that one. That one was, that one was really fun. And then, um, then uh, I kind of like went through this weird phase where I just like burned every bridge with everyone I knew ever, you know? So I just started like playing music by myself. Now, you know, like I'd, you know, I'd try to get bands together, spiral, try to get bands together, spiral. But uh, uh, King Lazy Eye has been around since 2019, I think. But this is like our final form right here. We got a solid lineup. We played the East Stream last night and it was packed out, dude. It was so cool. Dude. That video of everybody singing with you that you posted a few weeks ago, how surreal at the basement, that, yeah, to have a real people singing your songs with you, how does yeah. that even feel, man? So like bef- the like a couple of weeks before that, me and Pearl, my drummer, me and her were at we're at uh, my buddy's bar called Liquid Smoke, and it's like a smoking bar in Murfreesboro. And so it's like a college town, which is also where like our first where we met and where like our first bands would play because it's a MTSU is a music college. And so uh, we were playing at like Liquid Smoke, which has been there forever. They just had their 21st anniversary and I'm really close with the owners and stuff. But like, it was just me and her. She was on a cajon, it was me and acoustic guitar. And that was the first time that happened and like half the crowd sang our whole set word for word. And I was like, what the hell? This is insane. You know, like the first time it's ever happened. And then when we played the basement, it happened again. And it was just like amazing. Like this girl came in and I'm actually Brie. She's become pretty good friends with her. She came in, her and her, and her uh, old man came in and she had pretty okay tattooed on her neck, which is like, that song we haven't even released yet. Oh you know what I mean? Oh my gosh. Like, yeah. Yeah. Which is cool. Cause, uh, that's my, one of my favorite, we open up with it. It's like one of my favorite songs to play. And, uh, it's, it's pretty cool because like to her, it's, it has a different meaning than it does to me because like she actually has a uh, cervical cancer. And so like, it's just like, it's cool because it's you get to see your art and your things like mean so much to someone. And it's not just about your little stupid pity party failure of a love life. You know what I mean? To them, it's some means something completely different, you know? So think about how cool that is. Like when you were in jail, would you ever mm. have thought that you were at some point going to be able to sustain some degree of sobriety and have success in music or did you believe the whole time that this would eventually happen for you or did you think you would ruin it loaded guns dropped while i was in jail okay yeah I didn't know that. Uh, which is pretty How did you know that someone told you it's pretty on brand no i mean it was scheduled to drop you know and i was just like and uh they were like hey remember loaded guns i was loaded uh, loaded guns is dropping today i'm like cool any word on a bond you know like uh uh great Sweet. May I give it, maybe give it, tell the magistrate to give it a fucking listen. I don't know. Like, you know, but it, it dropped and, um, yeah, I got out and it was cool. I got it. When I got out of jail this last time, I did like a pretty good little run in County, like five or six months and split between Giles and Murray County. I had a hold and, um, I got out and, uh, I had like some money saved up and I was like, damn, I was like making money when I was just taking naps and eating bad food. I didn't really think that, uh, I was going to be able to, uh, I'm just like, I'm friends with like a lot of people in this area that are so talented, you know, like, I mean, everybody's talented. I mean, everybody's so talented at what they do here. And so I I just didn't really think it would stand out or anything like that. I mean, I'm glad it has, and I'm not bitching or anything like that, but I'm just, uh, I am pretty surprised that it worked out. Yeah. So when was the first time you got arrested? I actually kind of know this story, but I just want to hear you tell it again. When was the first time you got arrested? How old were you? What happened? Oh man. Was it the Civil War battleground? That's what I was thinking. Yeah, or just yeah, at least yeah. tell that story, even if it wasn't the first. That's story. part of it. That's part of it. So I actually got arrested for something else. I'd gotten out. It was like a bullshit thing, but like 
so it turned out I'd had like a hold, like uh, they had had a worn out in Williamson County for a long time from where I'd actually got into a fist fight with my old drummer on Father's Day on a Civil War battleground during a reenactment. So like it started off at his house. He lives in like, you know, like near the battlefield and shit. And then like there's like a reenactment going on and I was up off white Russians. Like who drinks white Russians on Father's Day? Like, know. You know what I mean? Like that's how like, look, uh, I was obviously not in a good place. <laughs> And, uh, and, uh, ended up like looking up and there's like, everyone's like, is this part of the reenactment? You know, like what's going on? And uh, I was like, shit. So I dipped out, I went and grabbed my guitar out of his house and, um, I was using, I did that, that day I did not bring my amp. Thank God. You know, I was using one of his amps. So all I brought was my guitar. And so like, I'm just like trying to find a place to hide till my grandmother with Alzheimer's and my sister can figure out where the fuck it is I'm hiding in this like really wealthy neighborhood, you know? So I do not fit in, you know, at all. I'm carrying a bright yellow guitar and uh, the police call me and they're like, hey man, you need to come turn yourself in. You have a warrant. I was like, all right, what are you talking about? They're like, <clears throat> I was like, I'm in Murray County. And they're like, no, you're not. Da, da, da. I was like, prove it, man. I was like, I'm not, I'm not there. And the whole time I'm like sitting like on this porch of this house that isn't mine, praying to God, these people are not home sitting behind like, you know, those like really skinny cedar trees that rich people have. Sure. They're just like, why would you, that's weird. It looks like something from fucking Whoville. Like, what are you doing? And it's like, I'm just like kind of sitting behind it like that with my yellow guitar. And I'm like watching them while I'm on the phone with them. All they had to do is this. That's all they would have had to do, and they would have seen me, and they didn't. So I don't know. I, I just think that's kind of funny, or it's God. I don't know. God has a sense of humor. And then my grandmother pulls up, and I just like dive in the back. She's like, "What's going on?" I was like, "Just get me out of here now." I'll tell you when we go. <laughs> and then a couple months later, it ended up I had a had a worn out about it. So, so when you reenacted, were you like a Civil War reenactor? Was this a thing that you did? No, I was at band practice. I was at band. I was at band practice. This dude lived jutted up to the to the the battlefield, like I like, like about okay twenty or thirty yards, twenty or thirty yards from it. We were at band practice, and we got into an altercation because he kept touching my collarbone, and I don't like that shit. You know what I mean? So he kept touching my collarbone. I was like, dude, if you if you touch me in the collarbone again, I'm gonna climb you like a light pole. I'm gonna disconnect the fucking lights. And he didn't believe me, and uh, it's really funny because like you know, like those old wooden like fences you see like in the South and shit, like, you know, like go around shit like that. Well, I remember I'd hit this dude so hard. I had him, I was grabbing him by his shirt. I had so hard his shirt came off of him. And when I had to pay my restitution, it was just said Jimi Hendrix (laughs) t-shirt. I was like, that's the one thing that you give a fuck is a Jimi Hendrix t-shirt that you probably got it like in hot topic or something. Like what? Like I have to pay for a, a get a fence. And a Jimi Hendrix t-shirt. I was like, there's no way to do a Civil War, I mean, a Civil War reenactment. He was in high school. Like what? Oh, I went in high school. I went in high school. I was a I was a grown man. Oh, you were? Okay. I was a grown man at band practice. Yeah, I was a grown man at band practice. No, I was uh I, I got away when I was younger. My luck ran out, I guess. I got away a lot. It's a lot easier to run on foot. Yeah. I don't know. It, they used to be different around here too. You know what I mean? Like it used to you get away with a lot more shit. She used to not be taken so much seriously and stuff. So are you still in sober living right now? No, okay. no I'm in my, I'm in back home, back home. Thank God. I was going to end up offing myself in the main common room. If I had to stay there another month, I cannot, I cannot deal with men who don't do not wash the dishes. To be honest, I'm not watching your goddamn, I'm not your goddamn mommy. I'm not your goddamn daddy. I'm not going to wash your dishes and I'm not going to, you know, I, like, I don't know. Like, I don't like people telling me like, you got to be home at this time. I was like, dude, I'm trying to play music for a living. Like, you're going to have to, like, cut me some slack. Like, I'm not going to do anything else. I can't. I can't do anything else. I tried to apply for a job at a gas station. Oh, your felonies indicate. like, yeah, well, you, I put the fucking metal roof on this speedway, so you can't tell me I can't sell the marbles inside of it? What the kind of shit is that? The reason I ask is because I don't know if you remember over the summer when we were talking, one of the things that I think is really cool about your story is that you did a lot when you were in sober living. And like most of my audience like is in recovery. Some of them are still in sober living. Some of them are still in active addiction. And when I was in sober living, I felt like such a fucking loser, you know, an adult in sober living. I did not believe that I could do anything, but you actually started putting yourself out there and you had some degree of success while you were in sober living. What was that dichotomy like to be successful, but then have to go home to a sober living? Okay. So I'm going to be honest. I did not follow the rules all the time. So I did do a little, do do a little sober living tour of every single 
working sober living in Nashville. So yeah, I got kicked out of a few. I got kicked out of a few sober livings in different ways and shit. So yeah. I don't know, they were all fun though. I met cool people at every single one of them. I still have friends that I still talk to every day that I've met at every single one of them and seen some really funny shit, met some really funny people, some really smart people. Yeah. It was cool. I mean, I don't regret it. I mean, I mean, I had to pay for my shit somehow. I mean, I was just lucky that I didn't get go to prison that I just had to do like half a year and then go to rehab and then sober living for six months. I was like grateful for that. But then like, oh, like I can't just, and I'm not saying that there's something wrong with people who do just go to work and shit like that, but I'm just like, I got to constantly be creating and like, and especially if I'm at a spot where I can create and sustain my life doing that, why the fuck wouldn't I? Right. Why wouldn't I do that? What, you know, like, why would I just throw that away to make other people more comfortable or, or because it's what is expected of me? Like, I don't know if anybody knows this, but I'm not a huge advocate for doing what I'm fucking told, <laughs> you know, and, and it's not, I'm not trying to be a smart ass, but like, I want to be a good example for my son and her working, being a hard worker is absolutely 100% a good trait to instill in your children. But so is not making another white man rich your whole life, that you don't have to, that I came from like. In some pretty shitty scenarios and I'm able to live my dream I want my son to think that he has that kind of power not that working 40 hours a week to barely afford the payment on his truck and his kids and shit like that and that that take pride in that and then put down other people who you know what I mean like because I that that shit happens all, all the time you know what I mean like like there's nothing wrong with being a hard worker being a blue I mean I was raised by that I know that I've had, I've had, I've dug, I've dug, I've been, I've worked at cemeteries. I've done granite. I've done roofing. I've done factory jobs. I spend more time on a forklift than I have with a fork in my hand. So like I get, I get working hard for no reason, like working six, six days a week, 12 hour shifts at GM and then not giving a, fuck. you know, like I get that. I know what that's like, but that doesn't mean that I have to do that if I don't, if I have the ability to not. Well, and you weren't wrong though, right? Like you are actually making money doing what you're doing and also through content creation, because I know a huge part of your success and some of what has helped you get bigger in music, I think is, is TikTok, right? Isn't that's where like a lot of it came from? When did you start doing? Yeah. Man, I don't know. I was hot. No. Um... Oh, you were? You were loaded? <laughs> you started? I didn't know that. When I, when I very first started, yeah. So there's none of those videos are even up. I was originally Heath Dedger. And then I got, that one got booted at like 100K. And then I got, then I was Matthew McConaughey. And that was some dark day. This is some dark days. And I got, that one got, I got deleted at probably like 400,000 or something. So now I'm, okay. but it don't matter. I don't, I'm not really big. Like they were like, what do you think about them deleting TikTok? I was like, I don't, I really what? don't care. Like, I'm, I mean, it does I mean, the only reason I started doing it was like my sister was like, you should put your music and tell jokes and do this and stuff like that on TikTok. And I was like, Josie, I would, but like, I like women, you know? So, but uh, I'm just messing around, but, uh, <laughs> no, but I did. And, it, kind of, and, it, and it, it took off. So, and I got, you know, I thank her for that and stuff, but cause like the way the algorithm works, it just, it's going to put you in front. You could just go on there and say f straight for 10 minutes. And it's going to put that video in front of some old grandma who just got done with her shift at the nursing home. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like a CNA somehow, but Instagram and Facebook is so incestuous that like, you got to like already have a following or whatever or what have you and, and shit like that. And like, it just, I don't know. It's just different. Like they're different now, but it, it didn't used to be, you know what I mean? Like it was, you already like Instagram, like the rich and famous, you know, that were like people that were celebrities that were like created or got famous through, you know, other means or whatever, you know, social media wasn't really a catalyst back then. Right. No, TikTok definitely changed the game. You know, it allowed other people to actually get out there, you know, and someone like yeah. you absolutely yeah. was able to get your music out there. Cause like loaded guns, most people, would you say most people found you and that song from TikTok or did most people find you through other avenues and then get to your TikTok? Like what was the order? I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't know. It's, uh, it was doing so much random stuff that, yeah. uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm not really sure how that happened. It just, uh, it kind of just, it kind of all culminated and stuff. And I don't know, kind of things just started kind of like happening really weirdly and in a weird order. It was cool. Especially when I got out of the halfway house, things started moving really fast. So when I was in the halfway house, this last one, my manager, my old manager, Meg, she's about to give birth. She's like one of my best friends. Her son's the one that recorded, or not her son, her, her husband's the one that recorded and produced 25. And um, she was like, hey, John Prine reached out to you. I wanted to talk to you. I was like, Megan, John Prine's 
dead. I'm like, what are you talking about? You know, and it was turned out to be this dude who, unfortunately, his name was John Prine, like for real, <laughs> like J O N Prine. And so he's like, he wants to talk to you. And I was like, okay, let's do it. Like, like I'm like, he thinks I'm stupid or something. I talked to him and he turns out he works for like Wasserman, which was like this really cool like Italian group that, you know, has like some bigger names and shit like that. And um, it kind of really like helped. Also, somehow one time when I got kicked out of a, a halfway house, I was, I'd stand with my buddy Darren and Madison, Darren Bradbury, he's a songwriter. And he also is, he owns a, a nonprofit called The Beat. So I was like helping homeless people work, which because there's no other scenario better for a recovering addict than helping homeless drug addicts and going into tents while they're literally smoking fentanyl. There's nothing better than that, you know. So uh, I was staying with him and somehow I drunkenly ended up at Margot Price's 40th birthday. And I was like, ah, I have imposter syndrome, like a mother, you know. So um, and then like, I don't know, some other weird shit happened and like that and just. It's, it's kind of cool. Things started kind of like clicking together. You know what I mean? And, and also I've noticed like the more I just started like taking accountability for like my shitty, shitty things that I've done and stuff and not trying to like sugarcoat it and be like, no, I was a real deal piece of shit. Like I did this and that. And like, I'd feel, you know, of course I feel awful, but like, you know, the only the first place to start to even um, make up for it is to say that you did it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. When you say take accountability for stuff, what do you mean? Do you mean address it with, the people or address it through your writing or start to address it even just yourself personally? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, everything you just said, uh, all encompassing surrender is something that I look, did not do. Surrendering is something that I was not taught to do. Something was that was not instilled in me. And when I learned how to surrender, it was so freeing. It was so freeing. I was like, it gave me like, you know, it was like a, a breath of fresh air, you know, like when I learned that I can't exert my toxic ass will over the world and expect things to fall in place for me. You know, that's my toxic ass will got me in a jail cell telling my son happy birthday two years in a row. My toxic ass will caused me to lose the love of my life who I have a child with who does not still to this day does not trust me. My toxic ass will caused me to potentially almost my entire career up before it even started. And my toxic ass will killed me and got me narcan over and over again, waking up in a fucking motel and the paramedics jump back because they're like, man, we're about to call it. And I was like, you're about to call it. You know, I was like, what do you mean you're about to call it? And call it off. Like, get the fuck out of here. I'm good. And they're like, no, you're going to the hospital. But yeah, I don't know. Do you know, could you pinpoint, you might not be able to this last time when that epiphany occurred to you that Surrender might be my option here because what I'm doing isn't working. Were you in jail when you felt that way? Did it take yeah, time? For sure. Okay. For sure. I'm trying to communicate with what some people call a conscience or God or, you know, spirit or spirituality or something. But I knew something had has always been there, you know, and guided me and helped me and stuff like that. And I not only did I you know it was there, but I fought against it forever. You know, I fought against it forever. And it's not like it told me to do things that I hated or something or like, you know, that was just like, you need to go out and you need to f and feed the homeless people three times a week or you're, you're not a good person or so. It's just like things that just just made sense instead of like uh, being so reactionary in a situation when someone hurts my feelings instead of acting like a cruel crybaby and hurting somebody, then like just like letting them feel their pain or stuff like that. You know, just small little nuances. And yeah, I found it. I found it in jail. I found it in jail. How long have you been sober now? Whatever your definition of that is. How long have you been in recovery? Well, I still drink after shows and stuff. I don't even like really like when people ask me that question, to be honest, because... Yeah. Well, that's kind of why I said it, because like, yeah, right? I thought that. Yeah. So I guess what your definition... I kind of assumed that. So what... Yeah. But you're not killing yourself anymore destructively. So I guess that's what I... Think. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I don't do anything. I don't like do anything else or nothing like that. But I mean, I, I'm Irish and native. I'm going to, you know, how hard it is to like keep whiskey away from me. Like I can smell that shit out. Like I'll, I see the corn growing. I'm like, I'll wait, I'll wait till it's done. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I mean, I enjoy it and I had to, but I really, I really, really, truly, honestly had to reestablish my relationship with alcohol for sure. Okay. You know, like for absolute sure. Like now I don't know, I guess cause I don't drink when I'm sad. You know what I mean? I don't like drink I'm to forget. You know what I mean? So um, I don't drink because I feel like I need to. I don't drink because like I feel like there's an emptiness inside me. I drink like, you know, if someone's we're around like if we're eating or if like my friends are around or something, I might have a couple of beers and like I drink for so long. I cannot get drunk off beer. 
I can fit so much beer in this bad boy, it's unreal. Like, and it doesn't, I just get bloated. And I'm like, I think I might go lay down, you know, like, I don't, and so there's a point where I drank a fifth of country club vodka a day and drove home from work and was like, fine, like, don't, never going to do that again. I don't even like, every time I even see that color of blue from the label, I like get this queasy feeling, you know? So like, I don't know, I just, and also not being around people that are bad for me. You know what I mean? I sacrificed my own happiness because I thought that someone else's approval of me, like women, was more important than being happy with myself, even though I knew that was wrong outwardly, like, duh, and it sounds very cliche, but I mean, subconsciously, no, I didn't. So like, I just sure I surrounded me, you know, made sure I was like, you know, I'm, I'm happy where I'm at in life. I'm happy with my band. I'm happy with my family and I'm happy with my journey. And, um, me, you know, I'm happy with my legal issues. I don't have any legal issues. You know, me and my PO have a really good, like understanding of shit and, um, I'm not running for, for nothing. So I don't know. I really like that. You just said that though. I think that's important. I'm, I am glad I asked because reestablishing your relationship with alcohol and not using it to escape when something is bad, I think is really key. What you just said, you know, because like a substance mm-hmm. becomes toxic when we're using it to cope. Right. So the fact that you were able to figure that out and have actually been able to manage that, like, it sounds like you, I don't know. I think that that's a pretty good insight, right. In terms of how you would reestablish that relationship, you know, that makes sense to me. Yeah. Absolutely. And it's also, it's also, this is not just me being silly. This is for real, but it's also to kind of like, to keep my family like, I wonder if he's drinking again. That way I could be like, yes, I'm drinking again. mother. I'm drinking again. I'm drinking (laughs) again. So watch out. So watch out. So what is the relationship with your son now? I know that you saw him recently for his birthday for the first time. You weren't there for a few years. How is that going? So, so like when Jude was born, the doctor wasn't even in the room, you know, like me and this girl, we'd been a nurse for like a month, a week or a month or something like that, like delivered. I was like, where's the doctor? You know? And she's like, oh, uh, we don't know. I was like, well, you've done this before, right? She's like, I just got a nursing school. I was like, oh, cool. I guess we're delivering this baby. And so when we, when I pulled you to like out and cut it and everything and like saw his face for the first time, it's like I saw this whole flash of like everything he was and ever will be and all this shit. And it was like the most powerful moment I've ever experienced in my life. Like, I don't understand fathers who don't want to be there for the birth of their child because like that was the most overwhelming love that I'd ever felt in my entire life. And it never wanes. And like, man, like I up to that point thought I was this deep and esoteric goddamn songwriter sensitive person. I didn't know a dog dick from a lollipop about love before that. Like I didn't know about love at all. And so, like, that's one thing that really always hurt me. And, like, I always had a good relationship with you. was always there when I was out. It was just when I was in jail, I didn't really get to see him a lot. And and my child's mother is really, really good about, you know, trying to co-parent. I'm not the easiest person to get along with. You know, I know that. Neither is she. And she knows that. And uh, But we, we do work really hard to, like... You know, make sure that he's over here a lot and he's over there a lot and that, you know, make for him to understand that mommy and daddy don't hate each other and stuff like that. So, like, I don't know, me and you just have a special bond. Like, absolutely. Like, that's my that's my that's my best friend, dude. Like, that's and I think that's one thing that really helped me kind of get over the people pleasing aspect of my life, which is a really was a really strong trigger for a lot of people is because um, you hold resentments when um, what you do is not good enough for someone else when, why should it be? You know what I mean? So like when Jude came to the picture, I was just like, I don't give a fuck what any of y'all think as long as that dude thinks I'm cool. You know, as long as he likes me, as long as he loves me, as long as, you know, it, I'm, I'm his person. Like, I don't, I don't care. You know, I don't know, man. It's like, it's been easier for me to let go of all kinds of shit. Like I've we, like a lot of us play this game when we get out of jail, what shit of mine is gone and missing. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, you know, so like even like shit like that, like just letting go of like even just like material things is like not even a thing. You know what I mean? Like it just like I just first off, I never really had a lot to begin with anyways. But if something happens and I lose something, I'm not, you know, poor pitiful mean about it and shit like that. Like I don't it don't really bother me, you know, like it like it would, I guess. I love the videos of him on your guitar. (laughs) Mm-hmm. He still loves his guitar and you're dude. holding him playing. That's so funny to me. And he's totally calm though. And you're like hitting it, and he's just like chilling. It's so funny. Yeah. So cute. He still does. He still does it. He's getting a little heavy he's now. A little bigger but, though. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. He's getting bigger. 
I'm gonna have to get a cello or something <laughs> soon. Um, <laughs> yeah. So like, I think the reason why he loves music so much and he loves music, like I'm not forcing it upon him because I'm a musician. It's something that I don't know if it's genetic or it's just because like when his mother was pregnant, it was, it was COVID. It's quarantine. It was a quarantine baby. So like we didn't go to work. We didn't fucking leave the house for like months. You know what I'm saying? So like the, the integral parts of his development in the womb, Sarah would want me to you know, play music for and stuff like that. And it, it helped him, it helped him calm him down. And it got to the point where like, if I like tried to like skimp out on not playing music that night, he would just like start kicking the shit out of her and stuff until I played. And so like, now he just, I mean, he loves it. Like he just, he likes to, I'm not like one of those dudes like don't touch that guitar. That guitar is expensive. Like I don't, it's a piece of wood with metal on it. You know what I mean? Like let the kid play with it. Any kid, I don't care. Like it doesn't, the shit like that doesn't bother him. Like let him be experimental with it. Let him hit it hard. Let him make it weird, make weird sounds. I was the weird kid in the woods with a piece of PVC, PVC pipe hitting it against the tree. You know what I mean? Like, so yeah, I, I think that's very, very important, but he, he loves it and he likes to sing. He likes to sing a lot and actually have a lot of videos on my phone where in the practice space down the barn, me and my band were kind of like, he had his, we just get a little noise canceling headphones and we were just like playing, you know, and I gave him the microphone and he was just like screaming and it was like sounded really good. And I was like, should we have like a toddler, like hardcore band? Like, you know what I mean? Dude, babies with those noise canceling headphones is the cutest thing on earth. When you see little kids with those yeah. headphones on, it's just like the cutest thing yeah. ever. Yeah. So what does King Lazy Eye mean? I started to listen to a podcast where someone asked you and then I was like, oh, I turned it off because I didn't want to know. What does that mean? Man, there's different. I've given different answers, but it was just when I would get messed, like super messed up and shit. And I was like driving or something. I have to like close one of my eyes and shit. And I've also had to like close one of my eyes and put it against the window and line up the yellow lines between the side mirror and the windshield. And so, like, uh, I think it was my buddy John, who's dead now. I think he's the first one that, that said that, called me King Lazy Eye. Yeah, I think that I think that is what happened. We are driving his white truck. When did you write Loaded Guns, and what was going on in your life when you wrote that song? It's a pretty rough time in my life, actually. I just gotten out of, I just got, like, my legal shit squashed just to, like, catch some more charges and stuff. I think I called it, like, a burglary charge. And I kind of, like, wrote it as kind of like a facetious apology to my lawyer, James, who's he's not my lawyer anymore. He he does other types of lawyer stuff now, but I I'd known him forever, like before, you know, like he was ever a lawyer and shit like that. And um, so it's kind of like a facetious like apology to him and stuff because he's always you know supported my music and shit. And he comes to my shows and shit. And I'm like tell everybody like that's Mr. McVeigh. And then everybody runs up to him. And it's kind of funny, but yeah, it's kind of like a kind of like it's not really a joke, but kind of like an explanation, sort of like you know like a really shitty explanation. The line, Mr. Wilson's got a warrant out again. Who's Mr. Wilson? Is that the DA or a judge? Who is that? That's me. My last name's Wilson. Oh, my God. Duh. I know that. Dylan Wilson. Mr. I thought what you think my name was Mr. I, I, Mr. Lazy Eye? But I thought it was like, Mr. Wilson's got a warrant out like against you somehow. And I was like, is that someone's dad? Who is that? No. It does sound like someone's dad for sure. It does. I am someone's. I am someone's dad. That's I mean, true. That's true. I guess someone does. Okay. I have a few more questions because I know you got to go. I want to ask you a couple of different stories from a TikTok that you recently did. Oh, God. Yeah. Okay. So you were going through your stuff and you found some things. Okay. So one of them is a newspaper article about your dad escaping from jail. Can yeah. you tell that story? Yep. <laughs> All right. So the to him, which I mean, I have the newspaper article. I read it to you. It's really long, though. He got pulled over with this dude. And um, I thought he was in Colbert County, but the paper says Lauderdale County, which they're next to each other. It doesn't really matter. But he uh, he got pulled over and like ate like he had this dope on him. And he, I think he ate like an entire like gram of dope, like good dope. And um, but he didn't know that there was like 10 grams underneath his seat. And the dude wouldn't take the charge for it, which is weird because since he was driving, he should have got charged with it anyways. It doesn't really matter. But so he was in the holding cell because he got charged with it. And he's like the dope kicks in, you know? So my dad was an, you know, he was an E5 in the army. He's thinks he's really badass. He's a wiry little motherfucker. And, uh, he just decides to just somehow make his way into the fucking ceiling. And, uh, I don't know how he did that. I've, when I've been in a jail, so I've thought about that. Like, how did he do that? I, mean, there's no, I don't know where to begin. No, no. It's like a little holding cell. But I mean, even then I was like, wait, y'all got like a drop ceiling in y'all's like holding cell. Like, I, I didn't understand how he got up in it. Like he had to drill, like it said that he like carved his way into it. Like with what? 
you didn't have your shoes. You know what I mean? Like, what? You know? So he got it into the ceiling somehow. And they were like, they came in there, they're like, where's he at? And the, the dude that was in the cell was like, I don't know. I don't, I don't even know where, where, he, where he went. I was, a, I was asleep, you know. They looked up and realized, hey, there's a hole in the wall where this, you know, messed out maniac crawled into the ceiling and was like crawling and shit. And they were like trying to get him down and stuff. And then he just like falls through the ceiling in the lobby. Like just like, Poof! and then like just gets bum rushed by the whole sheriff's department. They just beat the shit out of him. And uh, yeah. But not even like a newspaper article is so funny to me. I didn't even know that it happened. One day I just like got home from school and like I just had a letter and I opened it up and there was that newspaper clipping in there. I was like, that's why I hadn't heard from him in a while. <laughs> Amazing. He's yeah. out now, right? He's out. Who f- knows? I don't know. I don't know where where he is. Uh, to be honest. Okay. I don't know. Where I, I saw you were with him recently, or I, maybe I don't know how long ago this was. In his car, you made the video about how every single yeah. finger was blown, and he'd only have the he'd only yeah. oh my god a few months. Yeah. And you were like, what? The oh fuck, my god. Man? Yeah. I, I thought he was fucking with me. Like turned it up. It was like, and I was like. What are you doing, dude? I was like, your speakers are blown. He's like, no, it's just real quiet. I was like, dude, no, dude. I was like, you've got to go get your hearing checked. You got to get your hearing checked. He's like, wow. I was like, these speakers are fucking blown, and you don't even know it. I was like, that's crazy. That's crazy, dude. I was like, this is like a scene from like a, a really bad TV show. I was like, this is awful. I was like, and I, I kept turning it down. I was like, I want to listen to music. I was like, I'm not listening to music on those speakers. I'm not doing that. That's crazy. It's insane. It was like, is is wild. But, uh, yeah. One of the other things you found was a balloon from meeting a musician that you liked that you had done nitrous with. Are you allowed to tell that story? You don't have to. Mm-hmm. Just don't say who it is. I mean, there's not really much to it besides, you know, being a goddamn birthday dentist in someone's living room that you really respect. And you're just like blowing up balloons with a. <laughs> First off, it was weird because the tank got delivered to his house. Who's driving around with tanks of nitrous? It's just like, hey, what you, you got? I got heroin, meth, tanks of nitrous. Like, you know what yeah. I mean? Like, not nitrous, you can just, like, go buy, like, the oxygen shit. It's, like, actual tanks of, like, dent nitrous, you know what I'm saying? And, like, we're just, like, taking them to the dome, and I just kept that one because I just wanted to remember that night. I've never done he's, nitrous. Uh, what does it feel like? I've done heroin, meth, all the things, but I've never done nitrous. What even is that? It feels like it, feels like it don't last long enough. Right. That's what it feels like. Right. But I don't know. I mean, I don't know. It was, just, I don't know. I, I'd done so many, so much shit by then. It was just more for the experience. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't know. It's kind of like standing up really, really, really fast. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's kind of a cool feeling, but I mean, also, I don't know. It's actual brain cells dying, though. You know what I mean? And like that to me, you know, even though we know that about all that, of them, I think that's why you feel weird. That point in my life, I was not worried about that right. at all. Like, I, right. Yeah. I was, yeah. I could, I, could lose a, I could lose a few more, honestly. <laughs> and then I don't think you're going to have any details about this because you don't remember, but I just think it's hilarious. That old lady's ID in your pocket? What was Yeah, the car. Yeah. Turns out, actually, it's funny you asked that question because I found out today. Uh, I was talking to them. They're like, oh, yeah, no, dude, we were using that to scrape up uh, drugs and shit. And I just like put it in your pocket when you're asleep. And I was like, why would you do that? And they're like, just wanted to freak you out. Just wanted to see what would be. <laughs> Just wanted to see you do, see if you would tell me if you found it or not. And I was like, what kind of weird psycho shit is that? Like, what does that, what does that prove that I'm scared that I found a 90, that 102 year old woman's ID in my pocket from California? Was it like their mom or something or their grandma or something though? Why did they have it? I don't know. I mean, would they act, when I asked them that, they're like, oh, yeah, they knew, they know. I was like, yeah, but if you knew them, you knew this old lady, why, that doesn't explain why you have their ID. Right. No, that does not explain but, it. Whatever. I'm like, okay, yeah, whatever. We just shrug it off that you stole it. I mean, was she dead or something? You're just like, yeah, I could use it. For drug. Right, right, right. Okay, so the last little bit here. Where can everybody find your music and you and what is on the horizon for you right now with the band and shows? Like, what does the next couple of months look like for you with all that stuff? Okay, so you can listen to my music like Spotify, Apple Music, YouTube, you know, every streaming platform. So I'm flying out to Texas tomorrow to go do this uh promotional stuff for uh memphis no, i mean not memphis but uh dallas is uh tattoo festival on elm street so this is it's pretty exciting because like tomorrow when i fly out it'll be the first time i've actually been able to leave the state in four years so pretty stoked about that it doesn't mean i haven't left the state it just means it's the first time that i'm like please don't get pulled over you know yeah i like woke up in indiana a few times i'm like god damn it but um, wait indiana this far from tennessee oh i know <laughs> very aware 
Do you have any idea what happened? Why did that even happen? I, I was hanging out with this, my buddy. He's a bull, he's an ex professional bull rider and he's just wild, man. I always getting some shit when I hang out with him. So just shit always happens. But yeah, he lives up there and I'm like, why do I keep ending up at your house? Why, if you're just going to come to Nashville, just stay in Indiana. Like, God damn. Oh my God. I'm tired of this, but so besides that, we're going to do some runs in Texas. And then we got, we're open for Papadocio in Asheville and uh, a lot of stuff. I mean, you can find it, links in my bio of my Instagrams and stuff like that. We'll have my tour schedule and okay. shit like that. Okay. And, uh, but I'm try, we're trying to start recording soon. And I've just been writing a lot. I've been super stressed out. And I've figured out that like the more stressed I am, the more I write, which is kind of a good thing. Because I mean, it just stresses me out more and more when I have all these unfinished songs and all the shit going on. So, I mean, at least I know I'll never run out of material and stuff. I, th- I saw one of your videos once where you were like, here's the trick to being a good songwriter, suffer, just so, suffer. so much. <laughs> and then you'll have so much material. What does your process look like? Do you write at the same time daily or is it different? Do you have like a, a routine and a process? Kind of, sort of, not really. Uh, I don't know. Not really. Sometimes it just, it comes to you or, or whatever. It's different. If I had a process, my songs would probably sound more similar. But you listen to like my songs in a row, you're like, yeah, this dude's definitely bipolar. They definitely sound different. You're right. Like if you go through, you know, Spotify just does like the top listens, the top five. If you Mm. listen to them in order, they absolutely sound different. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Which I kind of pride myself on that. But also it's kind of like I kind of like run into this thing where like some fans like this, but they don't like that. And I'm just like. What in the world made any of you think that I gave a fuck? You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm going to write what, how I'm going to write. I mean, not to be pretentious or anything, but like, it's just going to come out however it comes out. Like, I'm not writing it for, to please anybody's sound. Like, I'm glad that people do like it. But like, if you're like, oh, I like the way you did it on this song, like, sorry, man, but I, I have a hard time giving a fuck about the way that you feel about it. You know what I mean? It's a shitty thing to say because like once you release it into the world, it's not yours anymore, really. And they're allowed to have their opinions on that. But I'm also allowed to not give a fuck about their opinions. So Yeah. And I lied. I have one last question that I forgot I wanted to ask you. You have two beautiful covers on TikTok. One is Fade Into Me and one is Iris, the Google. Page, yeah. Which I love that you wrote doo-doo dolls. Am I right? In the caption. Yeah, <laughs> doo-doo dolls. Am I right? I laughing. Do you have a favorite cover that you like to play? No, I was never really like disciplined enough to like sit down and learn the nuances of other people's music and shit. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with like learning covers and those dudes that can do that or, you know, amazing and stuff. Like I learned to play by ear and I learned by playing covers and stuff, but I really did that just to kind of like learn how to pick up on techniques and stuff like that just so I could like rehash it. I mean, there's only so many notes, so many chord progressions, so many things you can do. It's really just about like techniques and stuff. And some songs are, you know, like cool to do. Like it's usually just like spur of the moment. I'll do it like if I'm not like having in like some like small writer's block or or what have you or if, if like a lot of this covers I've been doing recently or like songs when I've been listening to songs or songs that Jude likes and stuff and just kind of like I put stuff, a lot of stuff out there just to kind of like kind of like leave for Jude if he like finds it later on or something servers don't crash in a dystopian wasteland or some shit maybe hopefully but if like you know if he finds it later on or, or something and if he just so that he knows that I can you know, and that I thought about him a lot all the time and couldn't stop. How often do you see him now? Now that I've been so busy, it's been like really sporadic. It could be anywhere from like three times a week to him staying with me a week to not seeing him for a, a week. You know what I mean? So it's just, there's no like really like court plan in place, but it's because like I've talked to her about it. It's just like, it's really hard for me to be like, I can get him this time. I can get him, can't get him this time because I'm like, don't know if I'm going to be even home yeah, or, or if I'm going to be, you know, especially with him being so young. Cause like, it's not that he's not self-sufficient. He's just wild. Is he? He has a four wheeler and he rides all the way down this driveway on <laughs> crashes and flips over and like, doesn't phase him until he does it a few times. And he's just like riding around with, like muddy tears streaking down his face, just crying. Oh no. Driving. And I'm like, buddy, you want to come inside? He's like, Mm-mm, you know, and he's just like a tough little son of a bitch. And I love it. But also you know, he likes to like run off in the woods and stuff. He's not scared of anything. And I, I love that about him. But it's also terrifying, you know, so like you can't you gotta, like really keep an eye on him. Plus, I have a pool out here. So like as soon as I lose sight of him, I'm like, he's running for the pool. You know, like my paranoia kicks in. And so. Well, I'm glad she works with you on that. Like you said, it's not always easy to co-parent, but I'm glad that y'all have been able to figure that out. And she works with your schedule. 
is. She's a really good woman, a really good mama. She did not have it easy growing up, and she's just like so stoic and um, powerful, really. Yeah. I was going to say, I can't thank you enough for your time. I know you don't do a lot of these. And I've wanted to interview you for like literally years. I know I you've been like bugging the f- out of me about this. So I'm just, <laughs> I'm just kidding. That makes me proud though. No, because I actually need to get better about like hounding people like guests. So I'll ask once. And if they say no, I'm like, <gasps> I just get so like embarrassed. I never ask again. But like friends of mine that do podcasts that are huge are like, hey, ask again, you ask to, again. You, like, diversify okay. your, you need to diversify your tactics, like dig up some blackmail. Right. Their, exactly. Exactly. Hostage. <laughs> if you don't do this podcast, yeah. you're never gonna see Mr. Sprinkles again. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So no, I'm glad. I'm glad you felt like I was hounding you. I did. If you ever check our DMs on like Instagram, TikTok, any platform, I could. I was like, Hey, man. I know you don't know me, but I think you're. 